Welcome home. This is Audio EXP for the 16th of March, and the episode title is Theories on Watsy, D&D, and AI. Lunar Shadow Designs won the March vote, and I am mid-QA with Craig, so sit tight. Now, this week, I thought I had seen Wizards of the Coast advertising Pathfinder. What happened was that D&D Beyond announced a Dungeons & Dragons partnership with Start Playing. It included a referral link to get £10 off. Start Playing is a site that connects you with a professional GM. The service costs money and your cash goes to Start Playing, but mainly to the GM. If Start Playing has grown big enough to attract Wizards of the Coast's attention, then it means it has cracked the chicken and egg puzzle of looking for group sites. See, nobody will use them unless enough people use them. The referral link means that both Watsy and Start Playing can see how many new gamers take up the system because of the D&D Beyond recommendation. I wrote a blog piece on the deal, in part inspired by Start Playing continuing to facilitate Pathfinder and other games, but also because of what I think this means we can infer from Watsy's strategy. A big strength D&D has over rivals is that despite the challenges of getting a regular tabletop game, it is far easier to get a Dungeons & Dragons game. People know it, people want to play it, and that chicken and egg critical mass for tabletop games has been achieved. In this sense, D&D actually has more to lose than gain for looking for group sites taking off. However, if no one can get a game at all, then the hobby will wither, and Wizards of the Coast will lose out. I think this is why Wizards have plugged Start Playing. That and maybe a financial cut of the pie. Right now, Wizards don't make money when people play D&D. They only make money when people buy D&D. The virtual tabletop they're working on, currently in pre-release and called Maps, might change that. Roll20, which is a virtual tabletop, also has a looking for group marketplace. But if Watsy are dealing with Start Playing, then we might guess that they've not been working on looking for group functionality for their own VTT. This feels like a bit of an oversight to me. Of course, they could be testing the waters and they could easily buy Start Playing. It's worth noting that Start Playing rather assumes you're in North America and you're only looking to play, well, you're chiefly looking to play D&D online. It's no good if you're looking for a face-to-face game of Delta Green in Scotland, for example. And then next up, I read an interview with Hasbro and former D&D boss Chris Cox in VentureBeat. In it, he's pro-AI. Now, many people didn't like that. However, I think there's a good chunk of gamers who imagine this will be about Wizards of the Coast using generative AI to lower the cost of art. And it might be a bit of that, but at Watsy scale, the art costs aren't as large a percentage of the budget as, say, a new publisher on itch. I think Watsy, and look, this is just pure speculation, is more interested in using AI to do two things for D&D computer games and for digital D&D that uses AI to recreate traditional TTRPG experiences, especially for solo players who might not need a DM. In this article, Chris says, we're doing stuff around AI that's really interesting. As I said earlier, we're trying to do a new AI product experiment once every two to three months. That's tending to be more game-focused for us, a little more gamified. We're trying to keep it towards an older audience and to make sure all the content is appropriate. And then later on in the article, he says, you'll see more of how we're thinking, how we can integrate AI, how we can integrate digital with physical gaming over time. If there is a subscription model, something that people will pay Wizards of the Coast every month to stay part of, and if AI can read 
all the publisher's back catalogue of books, or here's a more controversial thought, PDFs from other publishers, then that AI could create adventures and be NPCs, and it could be that digital DM, and that might lure people in. Now, if that sounds like sci-fi, then what about a transmedia AI that helps coordinate D&D tabletop games, perhaps even by listening in and with an online D&D computer game as part of the output? So, for example, you could have group scenes from the tabletop, the face-to-face experience, which the AI listens to, and then go to your computer and adventure through the backstory of the druid you just rolled up. And just to layer on more hypothesis, if Watsi was putting human face-to-face D&D ahead of digital D&D, then why wouldn't their virtual tabletop have a looking for group marketplace? The mainstream press, well, the big tabletop titles anyway, was all about a D&D giant killer this week too. How's that for timing? What happened? Well, Critical Role released Daggerheart. Actually, Darrington Press opens Daggerheart for playtesting. Darrington Press, of course, is Crit Role's publishing brand, except it's hugely overshadowed by the Critical Role brand. But I suspect that's low on their list of tactical problems. I suspect carving out market share is their main focus, and that's not easy to do. However, D&D did upset people enough with the OGL drama to shake the market needle a bit, and D&D 2024 could do it again, and any VTT or AI drama might also be a wobble. Notably, D&D can't go up in market share. It can only maintain the status quo. And that's a challenge because it means ensuring that people are hot on the game. I suspect Watsi loses more money from people stopping RPGs altogether than by players changing rule systems. To that end, challenges like Daggerheart and Broken Weave, the fantasy from Cubicle 7, that also launched this week, might help D&D if they help grow the overall size and freshness of the market. Okay, I know, enough shop talk, let's talk about some movies. Now, Bronwyn is one of many people who are cynical about the Crow reboot. The trailer is out and you can watch it on the blog, links in the show notes. But listen up, the Brandon Lee Crow is about 30 years old. I don't want a reboot of The Crow to feel like a 30 year old movie. Godzilla Minus One didn't feel like an old movie but it captured some of the retro feel of Godzilla in new ways. And for The Crow, well, goths are back, I see that on TikTok, but they've evolved and are slightly different. They've got new rules, new aesthetics, and a new view on life. That new Crow must appeal to a new generation. It is not a sequel, and therefore I think it owes little to the original movie. Most people disagree with me. Except, and here's the thing, I have watched the trailer, and I think it gives away the whole plot line and the best bits of the movie, I really don't see why you need to invest two or so hours in it anymore. In contrast, Beetlejuice Beetlejuice is a sequel, and Bronwyn has a whole post about Michael Keaton raving about it, predicting fans will love it, and I'm seeing a lot of hope and enthusiasm. Me? Well, I'm worried. This isn't a reboot. This needs to be the same but different. It needs to be nostalgic and a novel. That's a hard challenge. A third find, not a movie, is an easy thing to agree on. The Lego Batman set of the animated series looks great. It's Lego meets wall art. And now here are some bundles for the outro. And first up, there's Cubicle 7's Warhammer, The Enemy Within, and more on Humble. Core and Star Trek Wiffrup rules are in there, so it's well worth checking out. Another, and this time in Geek Nated's policy of giving any affiliate cash back to the cause, is Owen Casey Stevens' Is Rad bundle. There's over a a thousand bucks worth of downloads in there for less than 30 bucks. And the money is going to help an RPG designer who is fighting cancer with laser beams. Sadly, because the chemo didn't work. And on that note, if our new AI overlords allow us, I will see you next week.